of the LACNOG session. We'd like to invite Luis Silva to come up. Challenges, solutions, and best practices to protect and prevent attacks targeting ISP infrastructure. So, good morning. So, let us now continue with the security environment that we have been discussing. The idea is to focus on the ISP environment. We'll now look at some of the best practices for many of you. Practices such as these are already used. But it's good to sort of remind this. I am Luis Silva. I work in network security with IPv6 and all the letters we find, the subletters we find in our daily work. So I focus exclusively on OSPs. So this is the outline of my presentation. Will you understand which are the attack vectors and the basic concepts of what we see in the environment of the provider networks, then the motivations that an attacker might have, and how much of your infrastructure is compromised. This is very important. We don't want to donate infrastructure to the attacker. So that is why it is important to know and to assess our own infrastructure. And then what we're going to do and how we go about our work trying to avoid making a network part of the problem and should be part of the solution. So we'll see what are the tools that we can use to help us along the process. So what are the things you deal with on a daily basis, the viruses, the crackers, cyber terrorism, social engineering? This is one of the most serious problems. Unauthorized access, data theft, natural disasters, and data and availability. So these are challenges for security. There are quite a number in our context. So we need to understand exactly who the villain is in order to see how we will proceed. Now to mitigate the impact as far as possible, we deal with many situations. When we speak about the false traffic in 2022, we had 58% of suspicious activity. The, these are people who might be doing some kind of scam process. Then 32% are bot activities and 9% is malicious activity. So this is related to fake traffic of 2022. Regarding the composition and the players of this false traffic, of this fake traffic, we had a quarterly increase of 17% in botnet host. Now, this is a scenario that ends up extending to 2023. In 2023, we have identified more than 1,700, and the largest number of command and control centers are in United States, Netherlands, and Canada. Then we have the botanist host of DDoS. They have the infrastructure for conducting the attacks. We have more than 250,000 botnet hosts for DDoS. Unfortunately, we see that there are two countries of the region that are at the top of the list of botnet hosts. These are Mexico and Brazil. These are followed by India which are also in the top three countries. So unfortunately, we have a lot of free infrastructure to the attackers, and this poses a problem for all the networks. Now, let us see what the CVEs are. How can we deal issues of security? We really have to understand this. So there are some acronyms which are not part of everyday activities. 
we have CVEs. CVE is for common vulnerabilities and exposures. This is a list of failures that were already found. These are projects such as those Love Honeypot or the researchers of the vendors themselves. So these are catalogued, identified, and are then assign these to the list so that people can protect themselves from the vulnerabilities. Now, where do we find information related to this? We have the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and we have the website of the CVE, which makes this information available to everyone. So it's not only on the defense side, the attackers and malicious agents also have access to this. Now, this can pose problems. We spoke about updates, and if you don't do reboot, sometimes a year or two goes by and you don't reboot, well, then you have quite a important infrastructure and your, your power is properly done. But throughout the year, there were 10 software updates that you didn't apply, and so attackers use that type of vulnerability. So attackers will then use the exploits. Now, what are the exploits? This is a piece of a program, a piece of code that we exclusively create that they exclusively create to take advantage of that vulnerability. So when these exploits are created, there are references to the sites, so attackers can have access to these exploits and access vulnerability quite easily. There are two types of exploits. Some are those that were already detected and have been cl classified in GitHub. You can also find them. And then we have the unknown exploits, which are the day zero exploits. So the vulnerability was identified, but this hasn't yet been propagated to the community for the purpose of updating software. So developers and vendors suffer from problems such as these and really have to prepare solutions rapidly for the community. And so to prevent uh, devices being vulnerable to the exploits, we have exploit databases for given devices or vendors, like the exploit database. So attackers can have access to information and quite easily if we don't do our job properly. Now, when we speak about motivations for DDoS attacks, there are quite a number of these. We don't have so much time, but let me focus on some of these. The most common reasons are extortion, unfair competition, vandalism, hacktivism, and people are there just to steal information. Therefore, regardless of the type of information, that you have to generate an impact, which could be financial or image against a company. So this is always negative. We therefore have to be very careful about this. Now, we have to understand how much of our infrastructure is compromised. These are some statistics some of the global statistics. So when we analyze this, the print is a bit small. Now, the Brazil ranks eighth. This classification has the list of the countries that have the largest capacity of generating malicious traffic or traffic that isn't very useful. For example, amplification attacks are generated in hosts that are among these countries. In Brazil, for example, there is a capacity of generating 101 terabytes, terabits of malicious traffic. Now, normally, uh, cert.br communicates this every year. Every year, we report about malicious attacks, and these, unfortunately, 
we don't have such an active role on behalf of the network operators in order to at least limit the number of these problems. Every year, whenever we prepare these statistics, we see that there is a growth and sometimes even a drop in the graph in one of the years, but the following year, this amount increased again. The idea then is to focus on the solution to these problems. Firstly, we have to identify the problem. We just cannot find a solution to a problem that we aren't aware of. We have tools that are free. You don't need to spend money. You need to invest or have an enormous budget to start figuring out solutions to your problem. Now, one of the cases that we can use is Shodan. This contains public information that uh, filter the networks. There you can see the devices, for example, port 80. So attackers can take advantage of this information to produce headaches. Now, why not run first before the attacker takes advantage of the situation? or so that the attacker does a brute force attack. So these are things that have to do with the software related to the device. This is not only about port 80, but many already added this, as is the case of Shodan, which already disclosed this information publicly. Now, for those who wish to do something in a more proactive way, you can use Nmap or even the mask to have a graphic interface. We have tools to do these screenings, which allow you to identify whether this is legitimate and that has to be dealt with. This is for the purpose of filtering or some kind of update. This is the Nmap screen. And this is a resource that you can also use. Regarding the services, we can add services. You can use OpenVAS to identify the CVEs, so you don't have to run out, try to find the version of each equipment and from each vendor. So we do have resources to do OpenVAS and use tools for this purpose. This will show you the risk level of the vulnerability that was detected. So you can then prioritize things in order to have the processes that are most relevant for that infrastructure. And in addition to the scan process, you have to have your own network. If we work with the entire environment, but I don't know the natural behavior of my own infrastructure, that is useless. So we have to use tools like RTG or Grafana or NetFlow in order to find the resources that are most used in the infrastructure. What are the IPs that speak most with the others in the infrastructure? So identifying, understanding the natural behavior of the network is important to detect anomalies. And if these are identified soon, this is very helpful. So integrated tools allow you to identify many of such processes. So we have to use them for our favor. In addition to that, we need to do documentation. If network documentation isn't properly done, then it is pointless in learning about the traffic. So we have to be able to identify where the IP resources are, what we were, we are connected to what is a VLAN that is used for the connection. This will help us on a daily basis to find solutions to the problems. So it is important to note that everything is part of a whole chain. So we bring the puzzle together, which is part of the security environment of the provider. We also have the ACLs. You can start with a simpler ACL. You can do port blocking, which is normally done for amplification purposes. So once again, we have to understand our scenario in the first place. The network flow will allow us to identify which are the ports 
records that are abused in the network. Now, normally, we cannot view these. We cannot view these. So you can use Natro to do blockings use, using ACL. If you haven't yet imp um, implemented NetFlow, you can start conducting the queries that go to port 19 or 1900, normally port 53. These are the ones that shouldn't be available in the infrastructure. They need to be infrastructure for a PPOE client. So it's important to do the basic things in order to avoid having greater headaches. This is an internal process that needn't protect us from receiving DDoS attacks, but at least this is helpful for the internet in general. Internet depends on trust, and therefore we work on the basis of BGP. When we conduct these actions, this is for the benefit of the entire internet. We cannot uh, so this is very important. Then there are other activities that we need to carry out. These are microtic images, but it's not only about microtic. We're also speaking about all the devices. Mitric has more resources. This is by default in order to make, and this is helpful to make this more visible. We are going to disable all the resources that we don't use in our devices. And we are speaking from resources that are related to our This also includes the allowed remote request of the microtech. We have to disable everything that is not used in our devices, which is useful for your device in order to better route packets because it, that is the goal of this. In terms of the access, well, access policies to devices are important. So each user has to have their own username and password. There has to be an um, access policy for the devices. It's not just admin or one, two, three, four. In the case of honeypots, any type of attack is going to use these passwords. So we have to be cautious with things such as those, not just open the access we put for the level three expert who is working on BGP. So we have to be careful with those usernames and passwords. Another process that we have to take into account is that of anti-spoofing. Anti-spoofing can improve the situation against DDoS attacks. So basically, we have two models. We have the straight, strict mode where the router will check the packets that arrive in an interface. They check whether there is a valid entry in the routing table for that origin, and the interface can reach the origin of that packet and see if it's the same one. And this will allow them to allow the packet to go through or to discard it. It also looks at the URPF lose mode to check whether there is an entry in the origin. It's not so complex. So in my critique, we also have the option of using flags. Here we can set up things and it works. Now, when speaking about tools that can be helpful, we have OpenVAS, we have Shodan, we have Nmap, Mascan, Kibana, or Elasticsearch, which does NetFlow visualization. We have NFDump that is sometimes optimized for NetFlow-based integrations. We have FastNetMon, which does NetFlow analysis and provides responses to incidents. And this is for those. FastNetMon has equivalent options that have to be paid for, so you can scale this up. Then we have Sabix to collect and analyze SNMP to see what can be best used by your devices. And together with Grafana, it ends up working very well. Then there are other tools that can be helpful. This is an association 
with a conglomerate of the trash that is sent through the border of your provider. So you can there stop communication through this reputation list that you receive through a BGP session. There are even communities that can be used to select the categories that you wish to use. So we have a free option of this tool that you can use. So this is yet another piece of the puzzle that can help us in our everyday work. So security is a global concern, and that is why we have MANNERS. So if you're not familiar with this acronym, please research this at MANNERS.org, because this will be very important so all of you at network operators can be part of MANNERS. So MANUS prevents the propagation of incorrect routing. They prevent traffic with IP addresses of false origin. They facilitate operational global communication and coordination between network operators. And it also facilitates the validation of routing information at global scale. You can then read this with more time. There is a lot of material. And if you have any questions, please count on me so that we can exchange this information. Now, regarding security, we know that there are a lot of challenges. We only had 30 minutes to speak, but I could speak all week on security because there are so many topics in this theme. But if we don't get down to work, we will continue suffering from attacks. This is my contact information if you wish to clarify anything, so I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, Luis. Any questions? Hi, Luis. I'm Thomas Lynch. That was a great presentation. Now, imagine I receive an attack from an IP, a given IP. I try to communicate with abuse. I try to communicate with a NOG. I try to communicate with people who that IP belongs to, and nobody answers. Is there a list where I can say this IP has ports one, two, and three open? Is this, does this exist at all? You mean a list exclusively to share with everyone? Well, personally, I'm not aware of any list that includes that information because lists uh, sort of dispersed. WatchGuard has the option of capturing these IPs, conducting an analysis, and this is propagated through BGP. So through the WatchGuard support, this exists. The analysis prior to including the IP in a blacklist, because this can be a false positive. So in that scenario of the community, I'm not aware of any tool that we can use in that sense. Then we have the things that can be the NIST that can use to be propagating events, but uh, personally, I think there's nothing that I'm aware of. Thank you. Good morning. I'm from Brazil. Luis, we have seen several network designers, particularly post COVID. Now, how does a poorly designed network have an impact on these security incidents? When we speak about network security, we often forget about availability, but availability is a security issue. So creating a highly centralized network is saying that they only have one single point of failure. So I will have to migrate all my clients to an 8,000, like all my BGP and everything I have there. So if someone comes with a glass of water and, and throws it over your device, the, that provider crashes. So we have to think that when we design a network, we have to consider decentralizing as far as possible. Of course, we're not going to do crazy things. We're not going to do things that are not feasible, but we have to try to make the network operational as the CDNs do. CDNs don't exist just because they are there to decentralize 
decentralized content, and so there's not just one single point of failure. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Renata from CERT.br. Congratulations on your presentation. I would like to make a comment. CERT.br normally notifies the networks that have services that can be used. Uh, Brazilian networks and the, the networks maintain the WHOIS contacts up to date. This will allow us to communicate this to all the Brazilian CDNs, notifying them about a problem in your network that can be corrected. Thank you. Well, yes, it is important even to telling the third people if you notify something, whenever we get a notification from them, we have to answer back. So thank you very much, Luis. A big round of applause.